Hello and welcome to our stream of Sindel Baptist Sunday Service. We're really glad you could join us today. My name is Hannah and I'm a member of Sindel's Connect Team. We have a great sermon coming up today and we hope and pray that you sense God speaking to you through it. As Sindel, we work hard to put together sermon series which help us all understand the Bible better and apply it to everyday life in clear and practical ways. We hope that's really helpful for people at any stage of their faith journey to grow closer to Jesus and to equip them in following Him. If you'd ever like to catch up on a sermon you missed or check out some of our past sermon series, we have a great media library you can access at any time via our website. Simply head to our website, sb.org.au, and click the watch button in the top right-hand corner. That's all from me for now. I hope that you enjoy today's service and I'll check back with you afterwards. See you then. Welcome to Sindel this Resurrection Sunday. We welcome you in the room and online. A very warm welcome and super glad that you're joining with us. This morning we celebrate the mystery, the wonder, but the magnificence of the resurrection of Jesus. And I'd love if you stand as we celebrate today together.
Father, indeed, how amazing you are. Your love, and your grace, your mercy is so precious to us. And it's our joy and privilege to stand here today and proclaim that you have overcome the grave, defeating sin and death, and that we are truly set free from that which has enslaved us. We commit ourselves and we commit this service to you, Lord. May we be aware of your presence with us and expectant of what you're going to do in our midst. And we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I invite you to take your seats. Um, welcome to Sindel this morning. If I've not had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Freya. Uh, and it's yeah, truly wonderful to have you with us today on Resurrection Sunday. Um, if you are new or visiting, a uh, special welcome to you. Uh, it's great to have you in the room with us, uh, whether you've been invited along or you've been checking out Cinder for a while, you've just walked in off the street, whatever's brought you here, um, what a great Sunday to come together and worship. We also want to welcome our people online. Thanks for joining us as well. Uh, in a little while, we're going to hear from our next-gen pastor, Mike Riddell, uh, with a special Easter message, so we're going to look forward to that shortly. Um, but before we get to some of those things, we just also wanted to invite you to stick around after the service. You might have noticed some different setup downstairs and barbecues and things like that. So uh, we'd love for you to stick around for free coffees, hot chocolates, bacon and egg rolls, things like that. There's also some special kids activities, um, Easter egg hunt, things like that at 10.30 outside Corinna. And if you don't know where that is, tap someone on the shoulder and they will point you in the right direction. So uh, something fun for the kids. As you can probably gather, uh, Easter is a really special time uh, for us here at Sindel, but also for millions of people around the world. Uh, in our own gathering here, there'll be people who know and love and follow Jesus with their whole heart. There'll be people who might be familiar through family or, or school, and still others among us might be really curious and have questions about what all this is about. Uh, so if, your service, if the services today or anything across the weekend um, has raised questions for you about Jesus, about the Christian faith, uh, or about meaning or purpose in general, we'd love to encourage you not to hold on to those questions, but to do something with them. And there's a great opportunity to do that uh, in the form of Alpha, uh, which is coming up shortly. So Alpha uh, is an eight-week course where you can gather together in small groups to explore the big questions of life. 
Uh, it's a safe space, no question is too big or too small. Um, I was just part of the course that finished on Tuesday uh, and it's a really, tr it's a great uh, opportunity to gather. It was so special um, sharing life and exploring those big questions. So if that's something you would be interested or someone you'd like to invite, um, you can go to that link, me.sb.org.au. You can register, get more details, or you can come and ask me or uh, one of the staff. We'd love to chat with you about Alpha. One of my favourite things about Easter uh, is the fact that because of what Jesus did on the cross, uh, we get to have a restored relationship with our God, who is the creator of the universe. And because of that, we can have like, an actual relationship. It's not just on paper, it, it's real. And we can talk to him, we can praise him. Uh, we don't have to do all the things that used to have to be done to commune with God. And so we're going to do that right now together. We're going to pray, um, encourage you to... Um, close your eyes, um, open your hands, take whatever posture is comfortable for you, uh, and let's pray together. Start with a few verses from Isaiah 25. O Lord, you are our God. We will exalt you. We will praise your name. For you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful and sure. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Our holy and mighty God, we want to magnify your name today, for you and you alone are mighty to save. Thank you for sending Jesus to live the life we couldn't live, to die the death we deserve to die. But you overcame the grave and you rose victorious over sin and death and you're now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. Thank you for that precious, precious reality, Lord. Lord, even as we declare your victory today, we want to acknowledge that there's a reason you had to die, and that's our sin. So, Lord, in the silence, um, we confess our sin before you and we bring ourselves before you. May we know true freedom because of what you've done in dying and rising again. Lord, we gather today with millions around the world to celebrate the risen Christ. We pray for our brothers and sisters in war zones, in desperate poverty, in refugee camps, in prison. On this Resurrection Sunday, we know that you, Lord Jesus, the risen Christ, are with them in the hardest of places, and we have a sense that there's no place you would rather be. So we pray that they would be encouraged and strengthened uh, in their difficulty, and that they can still look to you as their risen hope. We pray for all those who don't yet know you, for those seeking meaning and purpose, forgiveness, or an experience of the divine. May they encounter you today. Use us, we pray, to be vessels of your love and your grace to a needy world. We pray for Mike, who will share shortly, May his words be your words, Lord. May we have open ears and eyes and hearts and minds, and may we leave here today different to how we walked in. Lord, we love you, we need you, and we trust you, and we pray all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I'd love if you stand as we continue to sing together of the beautiful name of Jesus.
So Jesus, it's in your name that we've gathered here together today to celebrate and to sing. It's in your name that we continue to contemplate your resurrection and what that means for our response. And it's in your name that we pray and continue to pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. As you take your seats, let me add my welcome to you all today on this Easter Sunday. Throughout history, uh, all around the world and across all range of different Christian faith traditions, one of the ways that Christians have remembered and celebrated the resurrection of Jesus together is through something called the Paschal Greeting. You may have even heard it said to you or amongst others this morning here at church so far. The greeting is extended like this, Christ is risen, to which the response is given, Oh, well done. So, I think we can do a little bit better with that one. And so, I'm going to invite you to join in it again. I'll put the prompts on the screen so you know exactly what to say and when to say it. But this is something that is such good news. So, let's do it with a little bit of enthusiasm. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Not bad, not bad. But I have to admit, I've noticed that there's a few kids in the room, there's a few young or young at heart who might be able to just boost the volume a little bit more. And so one last time, come on, you know you want to do it. You can be noisy in church today. One last time, Christ is risen. 
Wow, someone might have just done their vocal cords on my left over there. Well done. So that's the new standard. Uh, And at different times throughout this message and throughout this service, we're going to do that again a few more times. So keep your ears tuned to hear those words so that you can respond. But those seven words, they help frame so powerfully and simply what today is all about. They proclaim that the death of Jesus on Good Friday was not in vain, for he has been raised to life again by the power of God. It's a power that overcomes death and reveals Jesus to be the most tangible source of hope for anyone. Christ is risen. Oh, I nearly caught you out that time. (laughs) Keep your ears attuned. Keep your ears attuned. Now, the Paschal greeting announces and it reminds us that something significant has happened. And it uses words that closely mirror those that were first used to pronounce the news of Jesus' resurrection in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But one of the things that's really noticeable in all of the Gospel accounts is that when the resurrection of Jesus is first pronounced to people, their initial response is not as confident or certain or loud as the statement that we've just said together. Instead, it's almost the complete opposite. There's confusion instead of clarity, more doubt than belief, more fear than hope. In the Gospel of Luke, immediately after the events of Good Friday, where Jesus dies on the cross and is buried in a tomb, everything stops for the Sabbath, which takes place the next day. But then on the morning of the third day, we're told that this is what happens next. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took some spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he is risen. The general mood on the first Easter Sunday was one of surprise and fear and confusion. No one was expecting what happened to happen. And these women are the first people to hear the astonishing news that though Jesus was dead, he is now alive. But when they return from the tomb to share this unexpected development with the other disciples, they're met with a dismissive doubt. Here's how Luke describes it. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the disciples. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. It's challenging to think that the first people to doubt the resurrection or the pronouncement of the resurrection were the people closest to Jesus. Even Peter, who goes to investigate for himself and finds an empty tomb, walks away wondering what it all means. And so while the word is out that Jesus has risen, perhaps due to the doubt and the trauma of the past few days, it seems that almost everyone remains in the dark pit of hopelessness. If you've ever had to navigate an experience of uncertainty or doubt, you can relate to how these disappointed disciples are likely feeling or can imagine what they might be thinking. If you've ever been left perplexed by an unexpected turn of events that your life has taken, or perhaps you have questions which remain unanswered to this day about a whole range of different things, you might be able to relate to that feeling of hopelessness or that sense that your faith feels like it is crumbling under the devastation of tragedy. Maybe that describes your situation and thinking right now. Perhaps this Easter Sunday, you have more doubts than belief, more confusion than clarity, more uncertainty about whether hope in Jesus is even a worthwhile 
thing. One of the comforting reminders from the story of Easter Sunday is that the diversity of responses from those who were first told about the resurrection of Jesus can help us to be honest about our own response to it. And whether from a current position of faith or doubt or just indifference, confidence or confusion, today we all have the opportunity to consider what's my response to the resurrection of Jesus. The surprising nature of Easter is that it proclaims news that reveals things that we might not expect or we weren't inclined to believe or that we struggle to understand. And so to help us to begin thinking about our response, we're going to connect into the experience of two people processing this event for themselves. If you have a Bible with you, I'll get you to head to Luke chapter 24, where we started earlier, and we're going to pick up the story at verse 13. The scene begins by focusing in on two disciples who had already heard the news that the tomb was empty and that Jesus had risen. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. So walking away from Jerusalem... It seems like these two are still trying to comprehend what's happening and what to believe. After seeing Jesus killed just a few days earlier, despite the unbelievable news that had emerged, their general mood was subdued. Grief tinged with confusion and unanswered questions like, where did it all go wrong? What's going on and what do we do now? But it's at this point, lost in the fog of their circumstances, that they're joined by an unexpected presence. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Now, while this scene is certainly a sobering one, what's taking place right now, it's meant to be a little ironic and a little funny. Jesus is initiating a conversation and he does so with a question that stops them in their tracks. What are you talking about? And it's a question that receives a surprised response. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, Jesus asked. Now, that's a curious, if not cheeky, follow-up question from Jesus right there. But watch how it leads to a deeper conversation where the two disciples begin to name what they're really thinking and really feeling. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel, and what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. So here's their grief beginning to be expressed in words. The two disciples have been following Jesus for a while by now. And as he said and did some amazing things, their hope in him would have continued to grow. They would have begun to think, maybe Jesus is the one that we've been waiting for. Maybe Jesus is the Messiah, this powerful leader who would fix everything that that was wrong in their world and in their life. He was the one who was going to restore their people's identity and standing. And so they had a lot of hope in Jesus. But their hope has just been nailed to a cross and seemingly extinguished with his death. And even as these two disciples begin to describe reports of the resurrection, there's still more doubt than belief. They continue telling Jesus. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. 
In the darkness of their disappointment and their devastation, these two are left believing that their hope in Jesus has come to an abrupt end. Their circumstances seem grim, their next steps unknown, and they're desperate for a flicker of light to bring even a glimmer of hope to them. And it's at this point where Jesus begins to bring light to what has happened and what it means for their path ahead. And he begins by shining a spotlight on the purpose of his death, explaining how the Bible has a lot to say about the cross and about the resurrection. Jesus said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, we're not told exactly what Jesus said as he explains the scriptures. And I've always wondered how long that Bible study might have gone for if Jesus is using the whole Bible to talk about himself. But as Jesus walks and talks with the two disciples along the road to Emmaus, however he said it, Jesus explains the scriptures in such a way to help these two disciples understand a really important thing. And it's that the story of the Bible leads up to and focuses squarely on Jesus, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The traumatic events surrounding the cross were part of God's plan all along. Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins so that anyone could experience life with God now and forever. And Jesus' resurrection, as Chris said on Friday, is the exclamation point that proves this to be true. The Bible predicts and reveals that death is not the end of Jesus. Instead, it's on the other side of death and through his resurrection that the power and the glory and the recognition of who Jesus is, is ultimately revealed. What Jesus accomplishes on the cross is proven through his resurrection. And so what these two disciples had seen on the cross and heard through the news of this resurrection, it wasn't the end of their hope, but rather just the beginning of it. And the only problem is they still don't realize that Jesus is with them at this time. So as we continue to read what happens next, that's about to change as well. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and then he began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Sneaky Jesus, again. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? It's at this point where these two have begun to see things in a new light. Jesus is alive and has been with them for a lot longer than they realized. What I find so compelling about this scene is that we're given a glimpse of what they've been thinking and feeling all along this interaction with Jesus. We're not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road. It seems that their journey towards recognizing Jesus and what his death and resurrection ultimately meant for them, it's been a process rather than a point. Like a candle that gradually catches a light. The, heart of, the hearts of these two disciples has been warming to this point of realisation of the risen Jesus revealed to them. Or as we would say, Christ is risen. Is risen oh, well done. You're still paying attention. You know, perhaps today you find yourself in a similar experience or with a similar awareness as these two disciples. Perhaps there's a warming or a burning of your heart within because of a dawning realisation 
about what the message and hope of Easter is all about. It might be for the first time. Or perhaps it's a stirring of your heart for the first time in a long time. Or maybe it's a familiar sense that just is growing in strength in this moment and on this occasion. Perhaps you have a new or renewed understanding about the purpose of the cross and the resurrection. Jesus died so that we might have life. And his resurrection proves this to be true. Perhaps you've had an experience or are having an experience where you're beginning to see Jesus revealed in your life and he's been with you a lot longer than you realize. I'll never forget one of the key moments when Jesus began to be revealed to me. I was a teenager attending a service just like this one. And after hearing someone explain who Jesus is, what he did on the cross, and what his resurrection means, one of my friends, my mates, felt moved to respond. And so the opportunity given to respond was to take a step of faith, simply by praying a simple prayer, and then letting someone know that you had prayed it. And so my mate, he wanted a bit of support when it came to that step of letting someone else know. And so he asked me to go with him. And so I did. And as I did, I sensed my heart beginning to burn within as well. It wasn't the first time that I'd encountered the message and the hope about Jesus' death and resurrection. But for some reason in that moment, it was like seeing Jesus in a new light. With fresh eyes and an experience of an indescribable hope. I understood that Jesus died so that I could have life with him forever. And I had a stirring belief that his resurrection proves this to be true. Now, it's not the only time that I've had an experience like that. I could share lots of experiences or stories where I've been reminded afresh of what Jesus' death and resurrection means. Sometimes it strikes my mind. I might be reading something or hearing something said, and I remember or reflect about what it all means. Other times, my heart is stirred. It's warmed or it burns bright within. Oftentimes, it's a mysterious combination of both head and heart. But when a realization of who Jesus is strikes our mind or stirs our heart, it invites a response from us. And so to finish, I want to provide an opportunity for us to respond to the reality of Jesus' death and his resurrection today. If you find your mind compelled or your heart strangely warmed to this moment, if you've come to a realization for the first time, the first time in a long time, or you've just been reminded afresh again of what the message and hope of Easter is all about, that Jesus died so that we could have life with forever with him. And that his resurrection proves this to be true. If that describes you, then let me suggest a response that you can make. It's a simple prayer, not too dissimilar to what my mate prayed and what I prayed a few moments later. It's a prayer that articulates a step of faith and invites Jesus to be Lord of your life. When we view Jesus as Lord, we recognize that in light of who he is and what he's done, that Jesus really is worthy of us bringing our life under his authority. To know Jesus, to listen to Jesus, and to respond to his leading in our life. Inviting Jesus to be Lord is not a one and done response. It's an ongoing one. It's a choice that we keep on making. And so if you'd like to do that, can I suggest a simple prayer that anyone can pray? Jesus, I believe you died so that I could live forever with you. Because of your resurrection, I know this is true. Jesus, I invite you to be Lord 
of my life? What could it look like? Or what might it mean for you to say a prayer like that? Is it something that you might feel moved to do even right now? Well, let's take a moment to do that as we close in prayer. Let's pray. Let's take a few seconds to pause and to be still. Jesus, in view of what you did on the cross and through your resurrection, would you help us realize what that means for us all? Jesus, I'm asking that you might be revealed to each and every single one of us, even in this moment right now. Would you stir our minds? Would you move our hearts? Would you bring an increasing awareness of who you are in our lives. Now in this moment, if you sense your mind compelled or your heart strangely warmed, you might like to pray the prayer that remains on the screens during this time. You can open your eyes and have a peek at it if you'd like. Or you can silently repeat it after me. Jesus, I believe you died so that I could live forever with you. Because of your resurrection, I know this is true. Jesus, I invite you to be Lord of my life. Lord, would you hear our prayers as we pray? And would you continue to reveal yourself to us as we become more aware of your presence in our lives? Amen. Well, in Luke's gospel, the story of the two disciples who encountered Jesus on the road, it doesn't end where we finished with it. After recognizing Jesus, their response leads them to hurry back to Jerusalem to share this good news with others. But they quickly discover that they're not the only ones who have come to this realisation. Luke doesn't tell us the exact details of how, but Jesus has evidently been revealed to others as well. And so this realisation that Jesus is alive, it becomes a shared experience as much as it is an individual one. The news that Jesus is alive, it provides a living hope that begins to spread as more and more and more people continue to respond. And so as we close out our time in this service today, the band are going to lead us in a song that proclaims this living hope. Hope for you, hope for me, hope for everyone. So let's stand and sing together right now.
taken a step of faith or if you would like to do so in conversation with someone then let me tell you about the response card that you would have found on your seat uh, as you came in today it's a very simple way to share any response that you might have made or a response that you're thinking about making with someone else you know there's nothing better than having the company of others to join you along your journey of faith and you with theirs And so if you fill in that response card, you can do it on the card or there's a link to an online form. Uh, You can, and then just come and give it to me. You can give it to someone, one of the people with the lanyards who welcomed you on your way on in. You can give it to one of the members of our prayer team who are waiting at the back of this auditorium and they would love to pray with you if you would find that helpful or meaningful for you. You can also pop these cards in a locked box that's out on the Connect desk. Let me also remind you, about the festivities that are kicking off right about now downstairs. Free hot food, free bacon and egg rolls, cookie decorating and stuff for the kids and an egg hunt that's taking place at 10.30. But before you leave, I want to speak over you the words of 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 3. The Good News translation of the Bible delivers it like this. Let us give thanks to, God and fa- to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he gave us new life by raising Jesus Christ from death. And this fills us with a living hope. And so today and this week, may you experience this living hope because Jesus died for you and his resurrection proves that to be true. Friends, one last time for today. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So let's live in the light of that hope. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you join us next Sunday as well. Bye for now. That's it for today's service. We hope you enjoyed your time with us. Remember that if you'd like to go back and watch today's sermon again or share it with someone else, you'll be able to find it at sb.org.au watch. Have a great week and we'll see you next time.